work for Ramble. Um, I contacted uh, David some time ago uh, when uh, this conference came up and uh, suggested uh, that I talk a little bit about Bun Hill, a scheme which uh, Peter's mentioned earlier. Uh, his comment was, uh, that's fine, but he'd also like me to, to actually talk about other sources of heat for heat pumps. Ramble, uh, for those who don't know, is a uh, um, Danish consultancy. We design um, many district heating schemes, also many heat pump schemes. Um, some of the schemes we've done in London recently uh, and elsewhere, which may be of interest, uh, include a conventional district heating scheme down at Greenwich, gas CHPs. We're currently working up at Wembley with Quintain, again, a fairly conventional district heating scheme with gas CHPs. Uh, three years ago, we did a quite an interesting scheme down at, at uh, Gospel Oak in Camden, where we took heat off uh, an existing gas-fired um, turbine uh, CHP. We, we put in a one megawatt economizer and then pumped that heat to 1,500 flats uh, in Camden. I took... Uh, or David suggested I, I, I take uh, the report which um, Peter mentioned earlier uh, into London's possible sources of heat as a starting point. And um, this report identified many different sources of potential heat. And the ones we've been talking about today, or the ones that have been talked about today earlier, are the ones at the top, ground source, open loop, ground source, closed loop, air source, and river source. Now, in the GLA report, they contributed around about 45% of the total amount of heat which could be available from London. So the other ones down on that list, which are perhaps of uh, equal interest or uh, uh, w which need exploring, include data, um, water treatment, which is down, down towards the end of that list. That possibly could actually contribute 20% of the heat required for London's uh, for London's buildings. Likewise, if you add up all the, the building heat vac, building uh, offices, retail and gyms, again, they potentially could contribute 16% of London's uh, heat demand. The one which uh, I've been involved in is actually a scheme down at Barn Hill where we've been using the London Underground, London Underground which is quite interesting, quite, uh, quite uh, exciting, but actually, according to this report, would only contribute 0.0% 5% of the total heat demand for London. So whilst the London Underground may be quite interesting, whether it will actually contribute a, a meaningful amount of heat uh, for the rest of London is debatable. The National Grid uh, and the UKPN substations, which is another source of heat which we looked at at Bun Hill, which I'll just touch on, that, according to the GLA report, could contribute 1%. So it's quite a wide spread of different uh, potential sources of heat for London and each one uh, requiring a different kind of technology. So I'm going to talk about two, two projects now. One is Bun Hill, um, and also, and then my second project is one in uh, Copenhagen, which we just finished, called Copenhagen Markets. So Bun Hill was quite an interesting project because it was an existing scheme which was extended. Uh, phase one was a conventional gas fire CHP, and was extended to pick up these two potential sources of heat just on City Road in London. One was a London Underground ventilation shaft, and the other one was a UKPN transformer substation. And we, did a, we started a study back in the autumn of 2013 when we looked at these two sources of heat to see what, uh, what they could contribute in terms of energy um, to this district heating system. And the, in a way, the, the transformer substation was kind of uh, potentially the, the, more, the more efficient source because the temperature of the heat in the transformer substation um, was coming from the oil, oil cooling system, which the transformers are, are cooled with. And actually, what, what had happened and what's happened on that particular substation is that about 30 years ago, somebody had put in a oil-to-water uh, heat exchanger uh, in that substation. So in many ways, it was uh, kind of prime ready for um, extraction of heat. The LUL uh, underground vent shaft was, um, was different. Um, basically, we had a 30-metre cubed 
uh, fan blowing warmish air out of the vent shaft. Uh, temperature varied between 15 and 25 degrees C. So we looked at uh, putting heat pumps on both of those uh, two options. Um, part of the, the challenge was that um, we had to harmonise two different distant heating uh, systems when we, when, we, um, when we joined the two together, because that was part of the brief. So the, the, the original scheme, phase one, which was uh, designed and, uh, and built about three years ago, that was running at 95 degrees flow, 75 degrees return. And we had to feed a whole bunch of existing buildings, so there was a limit to what we could do in terms of reducing the temperature uh, in the network. But we, by, by looking at the two, the, the two heat pumps that we looked at for the two different sources, we reckon we needed to harmonise the whole system so it ran at uh, 75 degrees C flow and 55 degrees return. So the challenge was to get heat pumps which could do those kind of temperatures. The way we extracted the heat was fairly conventional, um, with the with the uh, with the air shaft. We just put a, uh, we looked at putting a coil in the air shaft, then a heat exchanger into the heat pump, and then pumping that directly into the district heating scheme. And with the uh, transformer substation, again, as I mentioned, there was an existing uh, an existing uh, oil to water heat exchanger which we could uh, use. We, we, we had quite a lot of data, so we could plot the, uh, the temperature of the, um, of the two different heat sources. This is the temperature of the air out of the underground uh, during the year, and we managed to use that data to plot a curve, and from that we could work out what the average COP would, would be. And in the, in the case of the, uh, in the, case of the, um, uh, the, the vent ventilation shaft, we reckoned uh, we could get a COP of just about just over three, a, a seasonal, se seasonal COP, and that's delivering water at 75 degrees C, and that's using a two-stage heat pump. With the, um, with the oil fire trans, with the UKPN substation, then the temperature is, the temperatures are, uh, were a lot higher, so we could uh, use that to uh, improve the COP. So the COPs we were looking at for the transformer substation were closer to five. So the scheme now is, uh, that, that study was finished uh, back in uh, summer of 2014. We were then appointed to act as the owner's engineer for the scheme, and that's now on site. Um, so currently what the situation is, as again Peter's mentioned it earlier today, the, the pipe work for the up um, Central Street has pretty much gone in, and we're now starting to work on the actual LUL subs, um, Sorry, the actual the, the energy centre, which is actually at the uh, LUL uh, vent shaft, and uh, at the moment we're hoping to complete and get the building get the system up and running next next spring. The the system actually has a uh, well, design has evolved since the study, uh, partly because LUL have actually changed their requirements. They've they've actually looking to um, increase the amount of ventilation air coming up from from the vent shaft, so it's, we're now looking at, at, a, at a one megawatt heat pump rather than a 500 kilowatt one which we had before. We're also looking to put in a thermal store there, 77 meter cubed thermal store, and we're also looking to put in a small 250 kilowatt gas-fired CHP. And, the, and again, it's, it's going back to what was mentioned earlier, it's, it's trying to look at working with Islington to see how we can exploit using the gas-fired CHP to run the heat pump at certain times of the day, or other times of the day to export electricity, and other times of the day to, we can dump heat into the thermal store. <coughs> Ideally, we would like to have a much bigger thermal store, but we were limited really by planning restrictions as to what we could put in there and the space that we had. This is just a, um, we're working with the heat pump manufacturer on, on, at Barn Hill, there's a company called GEA, and I was just chatting to them about other, other potential sources of, of heat uh, in the context of this talk, and they just mentioned a scheme which they're currently doing up in Malmo, which is from a wastewater treatment plant, um, which is large. You know, so we're talking you know, 40 megawatts um, 
C of P is greater than 3.5. Again, putting heat into a district heating scheme. And that, I think that that slide, I suppose, really kind of, uh, if like, confirms that figure of 20%, which uh, was on in the GLA report as to potentially what, what water treatment plants could contribute to, a, to the amount of heat required for a city if we used heat pumps. This is a scheme which um, we just completed in uh, Denmark. It's on the outskirts of Denmark. Um, the cl our client is one of the uh, one of the utility companies, district heating utility companies, which uh, feed a local area. So it's not uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Copenhagen district heating scheme. It consists of uh, uh, two two systems: the kind of transmission system at high temperature, and then there are local systems. Um, at lower temperatures in the each of the different areas. So our client uh, on this scheme was one of those local distribution companies. I won't try and pronounce the name because my Danish isn't that good. And the scheme uh, that we, we've just finished, it's actually for a, um, a new market. Um, Copenhagen have shunted their flour and vegetable market out, out of the centre of Copenhagen to the outskirts in the same way which uh, London has done some time ago. And basically, the requirement was to provide cooling to a number of different uh, market stalls or sheds. And the temperatures required for the, uh, for, the, for the market varied according to the usage. Some were at 2 degrees uh, for the vegetables and 5 degrees for the flowers. And in essence... Um, our client was basically um, commissioned uh, um, to build a energy centre at the edge of the at the edge of the uh, the market, which is in the blob of blue uh, blue there. Um, and in essence, the scheme consists of two two chillers providing. The cool required for the for the market, then rejecting that their heat to a heat pump, which then is then feeding into the district heating scheme. So by doing this, you effectively you've, you've got two megawatts, take it two megawatts of cooling, which is the uh, the the, uh, the demand required for the, the market, but the heat uh, is then uh, from the chillers is then exploited via a heat pump and dumped into a 3.2 megawatt heat pump feeding the, the network. And the kind of beauty of this kind of arrangement is that at the moment, because uh, there's a lot of demand for district heating, that you don't have to worry too much about any intermediate storage because you've actually you've got a constant demand for heat on the district heating side. The scheme's now been built and it's up and running. And... Yeah, I, I just find it quite an exciting scheme because it really touches on this issue of uh, how can you use heat pumps to exploit a requirement for cooling uh, in the rest of the network. And so, I mean, really, um, this slide here is just, just to touch on the, uh, the kind of uh, development of district heating and how, in, how we're effectively on the fourth generation. And the fourth generation is lower temperature circuits using uh, heat pumps feeding into the network alongside other sources of heat. So really, to conclude, uh, I think large-scale heat pumps can be used. I mean, some of the examples we've seen earlier today, there's no doubt about it. Uh, they can be used to feed into district heating networks. Um, there are some huge sources of heat um, <laughs> over, over and above the conventional ground or water or air source that we've normally uh, identified with heat pumps. <laughs> I think there will be big interface issues. It's quite interesting. Uh, in one of the issues w that we've had with, uh, on the uh, Bun Hill scheme is the whole issue about whether uh, Islington should be paying uh, the underground for the heat that they're extracting. And, uh, and I can see uh, in the future that if we are going to start extracting heat from these different sources, the, a, there is a sort of issue about how do you... Um, how do you actually compensate for that for that so that, that source of energy? Um, and one of the reasons why you know uh, we've only gone ahead with the uh, with the LUL scheme is that the UKPN uh, you know 
initially they were very interested and they were working with us and uh, I said potentially I, I felt that was a better scheme than the, uh, the vent shaft but at the end of the day um, you know UKBN sort of lost interest all too difficult too much like hard work they started saying that they'd have to upgrade all their transformers if we started using the heat exchanger uh, and so that it kind of very quickly just unraveled and um, and even with LUL, it's been it's been hard work, and I mean Peter's been involved on the sidelines, just making sure that it's happened. Because in many ways, for LUL, it's just a pain in the ass. Uh, our scheme, it's you know, it, they're getting some they're getting some publicity now, and and it's uh, kind of exciting. But uh, there are, there are real issues about how do you communicate and how do you agree with these other people, uh, with these uh, sources of with these owners of these other sources of heat. Uh, and making sure that it's to everybody's benefit.